ASEAN Dailies, first and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Welcome to Durian ASEAN. You are with Grace. Hi, this is Gauri, and you're listening to us on our ASEAN Daily on a Wednesday morning. Yes. So we'll be、um, discussing about this very controversial issues that's been going on for、uh, for about a few months already, and then now the government has taken sort of an action、uh, towards the media agency, and then it, it is another issue, and the,、um, the one of the media agency, the Edge. Has uh, uh, reported very, very aggressively and also extensively on the, on the one MDB issues. And this、uh, was, of course, we、uh, touched on it just briefly yesterday about how uh, the uh, Edge has actually come forward and give a very、uh, extensive and a very detailed report、uh, because they felt like it was their duty and their obligation to get the truth out to the public.、Uh, but at the same time,、uh, of course, this is dealing with some very sensitive issue here. Correct. And the CEO himself has、uh, come out to make a statement saying that. Uh, he he knows that it's difficult and dangerous,、uh, but it's their duty to actually report whatever they find to the public and not with withhold、uh, any information. And apart from that,、uh, how they did this was they actually had their journalists to.、Uh, Reach out to people, get some contacts, see、uh, who can actually help them out with the investigation, and they found out that there were a lot of、uh, emails and documents、uh, detailing how One MDB was、uh, or the whole、uh, scheme that that One MDB was actually set up for a good reason, but it was misused、uh, in. Uh, greedy ways because people wanted to make money,、uh, wanted to make billions out of it,、uh, all the way、uh, in Saudi, and that sort of twisted the whole thing. And upon finding out all this, they couldn't just keep quiet and throw it all away. They had to, they wanted to actually get it out to the public and make sure everyone knew what was happening. And the CEO himself has、uh, given a statement to the police yesterday. And、uh, this is、uh, something that、uh, public should know because, according to them, when they read all those emails and the trails, they really, really shocked them. And they, they had the two choices basically: but what,、uh, whether they could just, you know, they could have just dropped the matter and then just walk away,、mm-hmm. or they could just hold of everything so the truth will be、uh, uncovered. But then we want, they wanted to、uh, pursue the truth, and. This is very、uh, a risky step that they are、uh, they have taken, and Edge is one of、uh, sort of、uh, well known、uh, media agency, and even Prime Minister uh, Najib, uh, he said that they want to get the truth. He mentioned to the public, so it is only right as a media group that、uh, they believe and the principle to find about the truth and to be able to deliver what's going on in the nation to to public is it's. It is a right step for、uh, for them to do so, even though it is very dangerous. And what happened was just、uh, perhaps a week ago, even the Sarawak Sarawak report it was、uh, badly、uh, threatened by the government. So all these steps that they have taken to reveal the truth, but then it, there is always a contradiction when it comes to government announcement, what they really want to do, and then when we carry out、uh, the sort of the tasks,、mm-hmm. we are always t- be threatened、uh, threatened by the government. And、uh, it seems that they believe that their articles have been of help to various government agencies, and I think not just for government agencies, even for people、uh, looking for information about One MDB,、uh, they have been turning. Uh, to a lot of the online media,、uh, trying to look for somebody who is unbiased, somebody who will actually report、uh, what's happening, as opposed to just、uh, sugarcoating their report and、uh, releasing、uh, what will、uh, please the government or any other party that's involved. Because,、uh, like you were just mentioning, at the end of the day, people want the truth, well, and the, our prime minister has also promised us that he will、uh, investigate. He set up a special task force as well. And he wants、uh, the truth to get out there. And I think what the Edge、uh, done here is quite exemplary.、Uh, they have actually, they tried their their best to do the job that、right. 
they are supposed to uh, as a media they have to give the truth to the public and they also did a very uh, extensive uh, research on the whole matter and it was backed by evidence uh, and all the documents and emails and they stand by their by their report uh, even when they were questioned uh, by the police so I think this is also something sort of like a wake-up call for every for anyone who still thinks that 1MDB is not something that we should worry about uh, it's gotten to a point where it's so bad now you just cannot ignore it anymore and then uh, what exactly happened was the Edge Media Group they handed over all the documents uh, including mm-hmm. uh, emails and even the hard disk uh, of the oldest position of the 1MDB issues to Ben Nigara and then uh, uh, apart from getting shocked by reading all those emails but all those documents they have uh, read it's pretty old uh, outdated and obsessed obsessed in it and recycle like uh, documents they had to really dig out the documents to be able to find the truth and also they feel strongly uh, the responsibility and a duty as a media group to be able to deliver the news and also be able to pursue the story to people and in fact a lot of us are very curious about this 1MDB issue and not only uh, internally but also outside uh, in USA and European countries are really concerned over these issues because it's not just a just a small amount of money. It regards the billions of um, ringgit and U.S. dollars that had uh, that have been involved, and especially um, after the announcement of uh, the, perhaps the money was transferred into uh, Prime Minister's the private bank account. That was another the story that was given to the public. So of course we really want to know the truth. And then Edge, we believe that it, uh, they have taken the right step, but hope that they can sustain. Uh, their uh, task and also duty. And same goes for other media as well. Hopefully they can uh, take this as an example. So we'll take a short break and then when we return, we'll deliver more news on the political aspect of Southeast Asia. So stay tuned. ASEAN Dailies First and the foremost news from Southeast Asia. Welcome back to Drian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. And you are with Grace. Hi, this is Gauri. And we are at uh, ASEAN Dailies. We deliver news from Southeast Asia. Now we are at the um, political and also other affairs around the world and also especially focusing on the Southeast Asia. But uh, this is quite interesting news and we can discuss further on this, which is regarding the North Korea. And uh, they clearly show that they are interested in Iran-like nuclear talks with the USA. And this is another concern that uh, North Korea has put on, uh, not only to USA, but around the uh, around the surrounding countries such as uh, South Korea, Japan, and even the other Southeast Asia countries as well. So uh, the United States and the five world powers uh, struck an, an historical deal with uh, Iran last week, and that, that will limit uh, its nuclear capabilities in exchange for sanction relief. But North Korea says uh, that's that's not they want that's not the what they want. So perhaps they are looking for another uh, perhaps the agreement, or they don't w- or even want to deal with all these issues. And this Iran agreement was actually a great political victory for U.S. President Barack Obama, who has long promised to reach out to his historic enemies, including North Korea. So he uh, was actually uh, made a pledge to reach out to uh, countries that they've not been having such a good relationship with. And uh, he's trying to reach out a deal so that they can improve the relationship further. And one of the countries that they uh, reached out to was, of course, Iran. But uh, like you just mentioned, uh, seems North Korea is one of those countries who are not uh, too happy about wanting t- or not too excited about wanting to be friends uh, with the U.S. again. And they are not really uh, interested in having any dialogue uh, with the United States, especially when it comes to giving up their nuclear capabilities. Uh, of course, uh, North Korea has been making a few threats uh, over the last few months about launching all these nuclear missiles. And they, the U.S. of course has stepped in and uh, said that they want to talk to North Korea about it. But uh, North Korea is not interested, apparently. And uh, among other countries, 
and North Korea is one of them who are sanctioned by the United States, European Union and the United Nations uh, because uh, of their ongoing ballistic missile programs, which is uh, quite a threat uh, to the other countries in the region. It's been going on for decades, and uh, uh, whether whether they are very stubborn and they have the, this strong idea about nuclear weapon, well, having nuclear weapon and also to be able to build all those uh, missiles and equipment, the the country can have its own power, but doesn't mean that it can control uh, when it comes to this decision making, especially the relationship with other countries. USA really wants to um, give support and slash help when it comes to nuclear uh, talks and also discussions with North Korea, but it looks like North Korea has always, always been very uh, sort of hard-headed and uh, very stubborn when it comes to this issue. And this is very serious and could be very sensitive because everybody knows that North Korea holds this nuclear weapon and they have it on its power and they are well known for a very strong uh, communist party uh, and they are the, also one of the, the very few countries that, that is controlled by the one leader and uh, the people there, they have... Ha- hardly have any freedoms when it comes to expression, even to leak any information outside of the country. So having uh, this talk uh, regarding the nuclear uh, uh, weapon equipment or even the missiles with other countries is very crucial and is really important. And it is only our hope that North Korea can soften it down a bit uh, to open their minds to be able to build up the relationship even further with other countries. And they have been comparing uh, the situation in North Korea uh, to Iran because Iran also has uh, a nuclear program, but yep. because uh, they also they were more willing to discuss things with the U.S. But uh, a spokesman from the foreign ministry in North Korea uh, also said that it's not really a logic for them to compare the Iran nuclear agreement because uh, North Korea is more subjected right. to provocative uh, U.S. military movement, uh, U.S. military, uh, their massive military exercises, and uh, all this also sort of give a threat right. to North Korea. So they're wondering, why should we back down if you guys already have the strong military power that's also posing a threat to us? Uh-huh. So it seems like... Uh, Neither one of these country is going to give in to one another. Exactly. Well, um, we can't predict or we can't even expect what North Korea will do in the future. But we can just only hope that they can uh, uh, soften it down and also be able to perhaps communicate in even better manner uh, with other countries. Let's move on to uh, Southeast Asia countries, which is Cambodia. Apparently, this, con- uh, this country... The 11 Cambodian National Rescue Party (CNRP) uh, they uh, mem- uh, they were jailed uh, just yesterday for uh, insurrection after the anti-government protest turned very violent a year ago, and then they could also rock uh, the fragile truce between the country's rival political forces as well. And um, uh, I mean, they have receiving these jail terms ranging from uh, seven to twenty years uh, for trying to re open the country's only uh, designated uh, protest venue, which is uh, Freedom Park. A defense lawyer, Son Sweden, uh, he told one of the uh, news agents, which is Reuters. And this park was temporarily shut down uh, because of, uh, as due to an outrage, actually, against the ruling uh, Cambodia's People's Party, CPP, and grew among activists and trade unions in the wake of a disputed 2013 election. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so uh, it seems that this park uh, is quite uh, controversial. It's called the Freedom Park. Yep. And uh, this uh, 11 opposition party members uh, were actually arrested uh, because they were trying to uh, uh, go back there and trying to... Uh, Force, uh, force the reopening mm-hmm. of the park so that they can uh, hold whatever activities that they want over mm-hmm. there. And while they were holding the rally, there was actually a chaos that erupted and turned violent, uh, which is why a security forces actually had to uh, intervene and uh, fire tear gas and also uh, charge the supporters uh, with batons. And it seems like what's going on here with Cambodia is... Uh, 
of course, it's one of the countries that's not doing uh, too well uh, if we talk about uh, ASEAN itself. Right. And we are waiting to see uh, some uh, improvement in terms of uh, human rights, also in terms of their legislation over here. Uh, because <coughs> yes, there was a chaos that erupted uh, during the rally, but is it really uh, necessary? Uh, was there no other way of uh, containing the crowd that they had to resort to beating up the people with batons? But when it, when it comes to rally or any sort of a strike uh, movement in any other countries, um, it it only happens after the piling of their you know um uh, dissatisfaction and as well as their unhappiness towards the government. And what happened was these are all the from the oppositions, and then uh, they believe for what they believe in when it comes to countries uh or, or countries policies or even the laws, and this park, especially like you mentioned, it's it could be very sensitive and also very controversial because it says Freedom Park. So, I mean, what they what they did, uh, they believed what they did was really right, but then they were all arrested. So, um, it's only um, the consequence after they are all in jail. And then, how about the other parties when it comes to Cambodia parties, uh, not only from the opposition, but the, how about the the main party itself uh, from the government? And this is also seen as an example of how the government is actually uh, using the courts and using uh, whatever legislation they have yeah. to actually threaten these political uh, activists. Because, uh, like you were saying, the political activists didn't feel like they were doing something wrong mm-hmm. because uh, from their side, they are just trying to hold uh, certain events or activities uh advocating their cause, yeah. just like what any political activist will do. But uh, the government is actually using their power to show these political activists that, no, you cannot just do whatever you want, although this is your country, because right. uh, we're still here, the government is here, and you should fear us. And because of that, a lot of experts have also come forward to uh, question uh, Cambodia on whether or not they will ever be capable of actually having a dialogue uh in order to solve problems, or will it always be uh, dealt with uh, with violence mm-hmm. and by just shoving people in jail and beating them up with batons? So I think Cambodia has a, a long way to uh, catch up over there. Of course, it's not the only country. There are other, other countries that uh, deal with their protesters or political activists with violence as well. Uh, and we want to see them uh, moving to a more civilized way of uh, handling things, if I may uh, use that term. Uh, the best way to do it is, of course, uh, to have a dialogue or at least give them a chance um, to defend themselves. Right. Well, in addition to that, there is another news coming from the same country, Cambodia. And apparently opposition leader, uh, he seeks Muslim support. And that also in line with the Ramadan, which happened last Sunday. And that he hoped to create create this TV station, which will be called Sun Television, that will be inclusive of many Cambodians, especially including the uh, Muslims there. And that they want to offer the time to uh, Kamal Islam and then uh, one hour per day and uh, to broadcast the religious and the general affairs as well. And uh, apparently, the new government will also allow the this Muslim women to wear the hijabs and also in line with the Muslim tradition. And when they apply for the official documents, including the passport, identification card, and all types of the job resumes as well. Well, it looks like... Uh, by having this uh, one media in the one country will educate the whole uh, nation when it comes to specific uh, religion and then that will attract a lot of uh, Muslim community but then the question is is it a really a uh, right or appropriate way to approach the community there right and this uh, whole uh, opposition leaders seeking for Muslim appo- uh, support actually uh, came because they felt like they had to do something for the Muslim community in the country. So that's why they had uh, the TV station, like you just mentioned, and he was hoping uh, for uh, that that this was actually educate the uh-huh. people uh, more and he also hoped uh, to the political leaders, he actually made a pledge uh, asking for the government to allow to build more mosques, more Islamic schools, and also allow girls uh, to dress uh, in traditional manner. And uh, apart from that, they also want public prayer locations, which they don't actually have at the moment that much, uh, especially in public places like universities, hospitals, hotels, uh, markets. In other Muslim countries, these are probably uh, the basic uh 
uh, requirements for a Muslim. But of course, uh, Cambodia is not uh, a Muslim country, and therefore they are trying to make all these demands uh, using uh, the opposition uh, leader, right. getting all the Muslims in the country together and making this pledge uh, to the government. But then this is very interesting, Gauri, because uh, when it comes to the government support towards the one religion, right? I mean, they want to uh, highlight and also be able to encourage all those people to practice their own religion. But then focusing on the one religion is uh, quite to the, the, quite a lot of mm-hmm. extent. It's also worrisome because uh, there will be uh, non-Muslims coming and then there will be a sort of conflict between the, when it comes to freedom of something or expression, or freedom of expression or freedom to do so because the government the will implement uh, sort of uh, sort of laws on on Muslim community, especially when it's especially mentioned that they want all the school girls to you know wear the Muslim attire and the women to wear hijab. So that probably will uh, carry out the sort of the messages to people you know that uh, the religion and then perhaps the law it has to be separated. I think uh, you have a point there. Uh because speaking of Cambodia, uh, of course, Muslim is not uh, the dominant re- uh, religion over there. And uh, when it comes to the minority community, it's always, always very difficult. I mean, we see what hap- what's happening in Myanmar with the Rohingya, how the Muslim community there is being treated. Yeah. Uh, it's just really bad. People are getting tortured and killed. Correct. Uh, and uh, it's a good thing that that's not happening in a lot of other countries, uh, especially in Cambodia. Mm-hmm. They are actually uh, getting together. At least somebody has stepped up uh, to get these people together and to actually speak up for their rights. Right. And demanding uh, schools and uh, mosques and also, like I was mentioning, uh, their prayer rooms and a few other benefits. It's not so much about that they are entitled to this, but even a minority community in the country have the rights to demand uh, the basic rights that they need uh, for their religion. And it doesn't have to be just Islam, of course. It could be any uh, religion that uh, we are talking about here. Yes. And uh, speaking of this, uh, I do hope that the government will pay more attention, not just in Cambodia, all other Southeast Asian countries, that they will pay attention not just to the majority, the dominant uh, religion in the country, but also pay attention uh, to all this minority ethnicity that you have that may have a different religion and also be more sensitive to their needs and uh, help to accommodate their requests. So um, that's it for our political aspect of Southeast Asia news. We'll come back after this short break. So stay tuned. We'll be delivering more news and discussing on the economic uh, side of Southeast Asia. ASEAN Dailies, first and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Welcome back to Drian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. And you are with Grace. Hi. We are with Gauri on our ASEAN Daily today on Wednesday and we are prepared to bring you even more news from Southeast Asia. Correct. So we are, we'll be just shortly discussing on the um, uh, South China Sea mm-hmm. uh, and also this is the uh, discussion between the Japan and this, uh, ASEAN. So Japan the nation, uh, they sort of wrapped up its criticism of China's land and the recl- reclamation of uh, these uh, platforms in in uh, South China Sea. And mm. what happened? Uh, actually, just yesterday we were talking about how uh, the relationship between China and Japan has not been so good over right. the years and it has uh, gotten worse. And uh, we also reported that Japan was not too happy that China does not acknowledge the fact that Japan has actually been helping them a lot mm. uh, economically, also mm. in terms of lending them billions of money uh, for Japan to improve their infrastructure. Uh, sorry, for China to improve their infrastructure. And today we have Japan. Uh, actually siding with ASEAN for the South China Sea uh, dispute where they actually think that China is getting a little too much in uh-huh. terms of dealing uh, with this whole land reclamation uh, procedure that they have embarked on. And uh, it seems that the Japanese are also fearing that this Chinese military base in right. South China Sea could actually uh, 
bolster Japan's influence over mm. the region uh, and also affect uh, their trade and worsen their relationship even and further. Yeah, and one of the uh, neighboring countries, the Philippines and also the Vietnam, they have been having these issues uh, rega- uh, when it comes to South China Sea with China. And in fact, the Japan and the Philippines have conducted two joint naval exercises in and around uh, South China Sea and also perhaps uh, it was in June that that Mr. Abe and the Philippine President ben, um, Benigno Aquino that said that they would begin this talk that would lead to uh, Japan using uh, Philippines bases as well. So Japan is really, really siding ASEAN when it comes to South China Sea. And perhaps this could be a good news because Japan is also a strong country. Mm-hmm. And just by going against the China alone, it could just be our uh, sort of just a try and effort, but then we, we don't know the consequences after that because it's a long-term issues uh, over decades. And I think it, this has become more than just uh, a political issue as well. I mean, f- uh, the fact that Japan came in was more because of their uh, protecting their economic interests, that they were fearing that uh, this will actually uh, affect uh, how Japan is doing in the region, and which is why uh, Japan has stepped up uh, with the Philippines. Right. And uh, it seems that China is all alone now, uh, <laughs> without any friends, because everyone, uh, not everyone, I guess the ASEAN countries are, right. of course, uh, rooting for each other. And now we have uh, Japan, who has also uh, joined uh, our side. Uh-huh. Uh, and they, missed, uh, like you were saying, that the presidents are hoping that they would begin uh, the talks between Correct. The countries, uh, and this could also lead to Japan uh, using the Philippine bases. So we already have the U.S. presence in the Philippines, and now we might also have the Japanese uh, going in there. So China, uh, better look out and rethink the <laughs> whole uh, "I'm so big and powerful" policy. <laughs> I like how you summarized the I'm so powerful oh, <laughs> the <yeah>. policy. <laughs> well, let's stay on our on our ASEAN news, which is more for uh, which will be focusing more on the economical side. That uh, ASEAN uh, apparently need to boost savings to fuel ASEAN growth, and we are also. Uh, coming towards the concluding of AEC by the end of this year. And the members of ASEAN must uh, strengthen their uh, financial markets for the region to tap its own savings and fill its own growth. And this is coming from the ASEAN Business Advisory Council, uh, the chair, chairman, Tan Sri, uh, Dr. Mohamed uh, Munir bin uh, Majid. <laughs> yes, he said this in an exclusive interview with the Manila Times. Right. Uh, uh, that the financial and capital markets are the lifeblood of the real economy mm-hmm. and must be developed to support the economic bloc's investment requirements. And of course, like you were mentioning, uh, the AEC is set uh, for launch. And by end of December this year, we are supposed to have uh, implemented uh, actual yep. integration among all the 10 countries. And there's a lot of things going on here. We talk, we're talking about um, the movement of free labor between the countries, uh, movement of services, uh, trying to open up uh, SMEs to become more regional. Infrastructure. And infrastructure as well. And also when it comes to uh, the youth, everyone is encouraging Correct. them not to just think domestically or nationally, think regionally, think of the ASEAN uh, market, the ASEAN potential right. that we have. And uh, so uh, Dr. Munir Majid has also uh, come up to say that we have to focus more on strengthening our financial market and that is the key to actually tap into our own potential and Mm -hmm. uh, to make use of our savings and we can feel our growth to be uh, as competent as the other uh, strong economic blocks right. around the country, around the world, sorry. And then, in fact, uh, to be able to achieve to have a single market, it will take really, really long time because even for EU, to be able to have a, this a single currency, they... They, it just didn't happen overnight. It, it comes with a lot of talks and discussions and, it's, and agreements. And it's still not resolved properly. We exactly. We have the Eurozone crisis. Yep. So, uh, regards to this uh, ASEAN and also its uh, ASEAN economic community, uh, there are a lot of expectation and it may look a very ambitious plan. But then after all, uh, like uh, uh, Tan Sri Munir said, uh, that it is up to the members and also the older citizens in Southeast Asia to really strengthen our uh, financial market to be able to achieve the, what we planned uh, to conclude AEC by the end of this year. And we have another very 
very interesting news. Uh, we can travel to India this time. Apparently, the nation will have about uh, 314 million mobile users, I mean, internet users by 2017, and that's just uh, two years uh, from now on. Yes, and this boost in mobile internet users will be led by rural India, apparently, yep. where the growth uh, story will uh, very likely be written by 2G technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, and this growth will be very good for India, and it will also potentially drive India to be for one sure. of the uh, leading internet markets in the world, with more than 50% of uh, the internet user base uh, being mobile only. And that is true. It's not just in India. Uh I think it's not necessary for people to have PC anymore and right. they have very specific work to do. Yeah. And most of the internet uh, business is done either through apps, through your tablets or uh, laptops. It's become so on the go these days that right. people don't really uh, count on sitting down and facing their computer. Yes, you have a point there. And then it is very good news that they're reaching out uh, the population in rural area in India. And India has uh, quite a huge population when it comes to, uh, um, that is especially to uh, all these rural areas. So it is good that, that uh, they'll be able to reach about that population in, uh, when it comes to mobile internet, uh, internet use, usage. And uh, yeah. As for the report, I just want to add that uh, rural India is actually moving very steadily towards uh, this internet-friendly mindset. Of course, before this, they were not uh, quite quite exposed to that or probably right. they uh, didn't know uh, ways uh, or the benefits that they could get uh, from the internet. And because uh, that they are more willing to be open uh, to these changes uh, as of 2014 uh, especially there's been an increase of at least 6.7 percent in the overall uh, rural population where they went up to 61 million users uh -huh. of, uh, the mo of mobile internet and i think this is uh, quite uh, a positive take uh, for india because they are also trying to move from uh, 2g to 3g 3g to 4g over the next few years right. uh, and so uh, yeah uh, gradually, hopefully, they will get there. <laughs> so uh, that's the end of our economic part of Southeast Asia. Stay tuned. We'll deliver news, uh, perhaps a lighter session, but a very interesting uh, discussion uh, uh, later on. So stay tuned. <laughs> ASEAN Dailies First and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Welcome back to Durian ASEAN. You're at ASEAN Dailies. We deliver news from Southeast Asia and you're with Grace. Hi, this is Gauri and we are back to share more uh, stuff with you, this time from the social cultural side of Southeast Asia. That's correct. And apparently, the Pegu Club could be Southeast Asia's most storied cocktail. And um, they opened a, a very long time ago, 1871. And this club stood as the classic example of a British officer's um, club. And it was a place to loosen up and it also took uh, from the, this tight schedule and then <coughs> and to uh, to have the, this crew of a pow powerful and homesick Englishman. And today, apparently this... This uh, seven-foot-tall uh, cement fence keeps the folks from the, uh, visiting the formal colonial jewel that a young uh, newspaper man named Root Yard Kingling <laughs> recalled as a fool of a man on their way up or down. And today the building, uh, like its architecturally British imperial, uh, littered throughout <coughs> Myanmar's largest city and right. continues to fall into a horrid despair. So uh, I think the writer here is trying to express his uh, disappointment on how this uh, club that was once right. uh, so so elite and so yeah. fancy, so glamorous, and now, like you mentioned, it just has like a, a seven-foot-tall cement fence and also it barbed wire on top that's keeping people out from visiting it. And also uh, people are littering there and it's uh, the walls are getting so and it's not uh, being preserved uh, as, as a 
uh, an architectural, a British uh, architectural building that uh, a colon is a sign of colonialism, uh, something that they should be preserving but yep. not really taking care of. Yeah, and th- I think that's the one of the problems that Southeast here, uh, Southeast Asia, we have here when it comes to historical buildings. We really need to be educated in a proper manner to be able to learn and know how to maintain and sustain all these buildings over the years. And um, um, moving on to the next news, which is about uh, Brunei, and apparently there is a demand for this sexy underwear in that country, and this is ahead of the hoodoo. <laughs> uh, that's interesting because yeah. uh, according to one of uh, the uh, lingerie, Lily Lingerie, yeah. uh, they interviewed uh, the owner Lily Young. She said that uh, a lot of women may turn their focus on undergarments from outerwear, but she said she actually sees that her business will really take off and she doesn't see uh, a decline in uh, the rec- the demand for sexy underwear, although the hoodoo uh, will be launched. And she said that her business partner actually told her this, uh, that the same thing happened in Saudi Arabia when they uh, try to give you more restrictions right. and uh, suppress you. You actually feel like you want it even more. And the <laughs> demand uh, for all this uh, sexy lingerie for and sure. uh, whatnot mm-hmm. uh, actually saw an increase of at least 15% uh, in 2013, despite the closure of the airport mall branch. And uh, what do you think, Grace, when it comes to sexy underwear? Is it a necessity? Uh, is it uh, something that you just want? Uh, how, how how do women generally feel about it? It's very interesting because uh, when it comes to underwear, nobody can see unless you really that's you true. know, uh, just at home. But oh, then you're something transparent. Yeah. <laughs> but however, especially of uh, targeting uh, Middle East uh, countries and also perhaps the uh, Muslim countries, it could be a very hot trend uh, when it comes to all those countries because there are certain restrictions and the women they they would want to express their fashion or mm-hmm. even their sense of uh, perhaps the creativity uh, via different types of clothing and uh, uh, underwear could be one of them. And she also said that lingerie does not actually have the same sales trend as clothing stores uh-huh. uh, and she explained that uh, her friends who own clothing stores actually saw some decline in their sales starting right. in February, <laughs> but her shop uh, fared better. <laughs> so for some reason, uh, it seems that people in Brunei or people in general, I don't know, are more concerned about sexy underwear compared to what they're wearing on the outside. <laughs> well, it is also for well, um, their own you know pr- pleasure as well. So well. Um, women out there in Southeast Asia. (laughs) And another thing is, uh, they also mentioned that a good fitted bra actually helps with uh, your health. Uh, Mm -hmm. For one thing, it cures uh, back aches, migraines, among a lot of things. That's true. If you are having back ache or whatever it is, it could be because you're not wearing the right bra. A lot of people, a lot of women out there, not only in Southeast Asia, uh, generally, we do not know our proper size. So we need to constantly go and then do some regular measured to make sure that uh, what we wear is correct and is also good for our health. Mm-hmm. Well, let's move on to our last discussion regarding this Liverpool uh, football. Apparently, they arrived uh, in Malaysia. To That's right. And then Gauri is, <laughs> you, look, you look quite sad. <laughs> well, uh, not, not really that upset because okay. I'm not a, quite a big fan of Liverpool. You're right. So they did arrive yesterday in a traditional uh Kompang style welcome that was brought <laughs> for them at the hotel. Right. Uh, and this is, of course, for the match that will be happening uh, this Friday, uh, 24th of July, against Malaysia. And uh, there were a lot of fans that welcomed them at the airport yesterday. Right. So uh, I think there will be a lot of people uh, watching the match this uh-huh, Friday. Uh-huh. And this is actually Liverpool's second time in Malaysia. Right. And the first time they came here, they... Uh, beat us really badly, six <laughs> three. So uh, I'm really excited to see. I I well do not think that Malaysia will win, but I hope <laughs> we can at least tie uh, with Liverpool because a lot of their uh, uh, star players uh, are here. But I think we can still step up to that and also 
along the way learn uh, from Liverpool. And uh, yeah, I'm hoping for a tie. Liverpool as long as Malaysia. Yeah, as long as Malaysia plays better than the previous games, exactly. I think that will be a good for us already. Mm-hmm. I mean, we know that Liverpool is stronger than Malaysian team of apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well, all the best to the football team there. So that's it for our news today. Well, find us uh, and also uh, leave us the feedback on our social media on the Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, as well as YouTube. And don't forget to download our TuneIn app uh, from uh, your app store. Uh, or you don't have to do that anymore because we have our very own Duran Asin right. app that you can also download uh, and listen to us uh, anytime and anywhere. And as always, for all the latest updates, go to www.duranasean.com. And uh, stay tuned for the next session, which we'll, we'll be interviewing uh, this uh, quite a well-known uh, local band called Kyoto Protocol. So stay tuned with us.